love to what I'd love to do now is kind of walk through the hands-on portion. Uh, there's two hands-on exercises that I'd like uh, us to try to all get through before the end of the day. Um, one is a vulnerable web application that I wrote that I will kind of just demo and walk through like I'm a pen tester and here's how I would attack it. And there's examples of all the vulnerabilities that we talked about in the, this morning. Um, and then uh, I would encourage uh, all of you, if you want to, to just follow along, like I'll just move slow. And if you want to just like click along or type the same things as I do on this app, we'll just kind of all do it together. And in that, I'll try to also explain a little bit of like burp suite functionality um, and how we're doing things so you can see it in action. And hopefully that'll take about an hour or maybe a little less. And then we'll see where we're at and we'll take a break. And then uh, I will turn everyone loose on a OWASP uh, CTF challenge uh, that you can use some of those skills or use Burp Suite on or against and try to solve challenges. And then we'll just take that until like four or 4.30 whenever we wanna wrap up. Uh, I'll just put a timer on it and say, we're done at this time. And whoever has the highest score at the end of the day uh, does get a prize. I will be reaching out to whoever wins or if you wanna reach out to me and send me your address, we will uh, ship you a book on web application security. So there's got some skin in the game. Cool. All right, so I don't know if anyone had a chance during the lunch break to try to download and install Burp Suite Community Edition. Uh, if you did not and want to follow along, and I guess, by the way, like this is optional to follow along or participate. So if you don't want to install or don't want to participate, you can also, you know, I'll, I'll screen share and you can just follow me. Oh yeah, I guess the book should go to the person with the lowest score, but that's too easy to game. I'll, I'll have the lowest score. I'm not going to participate. So I'll just be stuck with zero and I'll send the book to myself. Um, so let me try sharing my desktop this time because I'm gonna to have to switch between a few. Windows. Okay, is this working? Do you see like half my that's or I'm sharing half my display, but the half that has Burp Suite open inside of it. Yeah. Okay, awesome. Uh, the book is the Web Application Hacker's Handbook. It's like the uh, gold standard reference book that's just awesome and covers everything web app security. It's pretty thick, so it's not like the kind of book that you read cover to cover, but it's definitely the kind of book that you can leave on your desk and reference all the time. Okay, so I, I know I said right before break that we'd be using Firefox, but I actually didn't realize that Burp Suite Community Edition now has an embedded browser. This is this was a feature in Professional that I didn't think we could use, but if you're on the newest version of Community Version, I think we can now just use Burp Suite's embedded browser. Um, I'm actually gonna close out and just show you all following along from like opening up Burp Suite for the first time, and we'll start from there. Uh, so Burp Suite Community Edition only lets you create a temporary project. Uh, what this means is we're just not going to be able to save anything. So if you delete Burp, if you close Burp Suite, you lose your progress. The pro is behind the paywall or the, the saving of abilities behind the paywall. So you can hit temporary project next, and then feel free to just use the Burp defaults and then Burp Suite will start up. Word of warning, Burp Suite does not have the most uh, slick and user-friendly UI and UX. So if you're a little overwhelmed looking at a tool like this with a million different tabs and options, um, don't worry, we're only really gonna be using a couple features of Burp Suite, that's all we need. But Burp Suite is really like a crazy Swiss army knife with every bell and whistle under the hood. It's very powerful, but we're just gonna be kind of scratching the surface here. So the main thing we wanna do, like if we remember, is to set up Burp Suite as an intercepting proxy. And so to do that, we want Burp Suite to be in the middle of all the traffic between a browser and a server. And the nice thing is that Burp Suite has now an embedded browser that comes pre-configured to do that for you. So we're gonna jump right over to the proxy tab. 
up top here. And this is where we're going to be spending 90% of our time in this proxy tab. Under that, that tab, there's four other tabs. And intercept is where we're going to start. Oh, yeah, dark mode. Um, and if we hit open browser here, uh, Burp Suite should pop up a Chromium-based browser pre-configured to proxy all data through Burp for us. So we're going to try this and hit open browser. And we should end up on a page, uh, empty page pointing to Burp Suite. And what I'd like everyone to do is to just try to go to like google.com within this embedded browser. Now, if I hit enter, what you'll notice is that the browser is just hanging. Uh, it might be hard to see, but it is trying to load Google, but it's just stuck right now. And the reason that's happening is because by default, Burp is blocking all outgoing traffic from this browser, waiting for us to take action on it. So if we switch back to Burp Suite, we'd actually see in the proxy intercept tab, a HTTP request waiting to go out. Uh, okay, Umar, I'm seeing your, uh, your message. Give me one second and then I'm gonna help everyone try to get past any like uh, errors in Burp Suite. Um, but what th this is annoying if you forget about it, but yes, by default, so Burp will actually just halt any outgoing traffic and ask you to take action on it, meaning forward it, drop it, or modify it. Uh, if we keep hitting forward, we'll see all the requests that have been queued waiting to go out. This is kind of annoying uh, because we just want to browse the site and just look at stuff later. So you can toggle this blue button, intercept is on, to be off. And then our browser should kick in and we should be able to load google.com. Uh, so my question for anyone following along right now is if you are able to get to google.com or if you see SSL errors. I'm, I'm so sorry, Ryan. Can you actually, I, I got just a little bit behind. So I'm at the, okay. uh, like the proxy page and yep. where do I go from there? Uh, if you're on the proxy tab, go to intercept and then hit open browser. And it should pop open like a Chrome looking browser window for you. And then toggle the button that says intercept is on to intercept is off. So that what, what, what I'd like everyone to be able to at least get uh, to, to get working as a starting point is that like the main page of Google should be able to load in your Burp uh, browser. And I'm, I'm anticipating errors and gotchas here. So I'm pausing to see uh, uh, who encounters something so I can help walk through. I'm kind of curious on one thing here, Ronnie. So uh, whenever you first uh, you know, opened your stuff up, it was showing a post request. And um, you know, after a few minutes of talking, it went to a Git request. And mine initially popped up with a, a Git request. Like, what, uh, What's going on there? Uh, I didn't pay too close attention at what the very first request going outbound was, but I believe <laughs> what's happening is this browser that, that per suite pops up is Chromium, which is the open source version of Google Chrome. So it shares a lot of the same code base with Chrome. And when the browser first opens, even before you browse to a page, it sends out a few HTTP requests, usually for things like am I on the latest version or is there an update available or things like that. So even when I popped open the browser and immediately saw some requests that had been like flagged by Burp Suite, even though I hadn't browsed to a page, those were like the initialization requests coming from the browser. And I think, uh, I think that's what I saw. It was like a post request to Google APIs or something um, that, was, that was coming from the browser. It wasn't coming from anything that I had actually directed it to. Hey, Ronnie, what is, uh, I have intercept off, intercept off, like you said, what is that exactly doing? I'm kind of curious about that. I might have missed that, but. Yeah, so when intercept is on, what happens is any outgoing request my browser tries to make, Burp stops it and just holds it and waits for me to take an action. So I'm, it never actually escape, like goes to the server. And this is useful when we actually want to stop traffic, like, okay, right there actually just popped up. 
So this was a request that my browser was going to make in the background. And because I have intercept on, it Burp Suite stopped it and is just kind of like holding it in transit right now. It has not actually gone out yet. It's just showing me. So when you have intercept on like this, what Burp Suite lets you do is forward it, meaning, yeah, go ahead and send that one or drop it, meaning forget it, don't send it. So we basically just blocked it. Or what I can do is actually put my mouse cursor in here and like start typing stuff and then I can forward it on. And so I've just modified a request that my browser wanted to send by putting some garbage in there. Um, so intercept is useful for when your browser is about to make a valid request, but you want to look at it before it goes out or you want to modify it before it goes out. The problem is it's kind of annoying if you're just trying to browse the web because like anything that I put in, like I just typed an A and now I'm now a, a request is out there and I'll keep typing and we'll see, I've just queued up a bunch of requests that now have to go out and I have to hit forward or drop on every single one of them. So usually what I like to do is keep intercept off. It lets me browse the web. Like I can, you know, still search and I'm, I'm using Google like I normally would. Uh, but Burp Suite is actually still observing everything. And Perfect, thanks, that cleared yeah. it up. Yeah, thank you. Cool. Uh, so when, when Intercept is off, like things are, are still happening and, and Burp Suite is logging it all. So that's what I wanted to show you next is um, under Intercept, the HTTP history tab will actually keep tabs of every single request that your browser has made since, since you opened it and started talking with Burp. So since I opened my browser and went to google.com, uh, I think mine is filtered so that the first one, they're numbered here, but the first one's on the bottom. But the very first request and then the second request, the third request, I can go back in time and basically re look under the hood at everything that my browser had done. And going all the way back in time, right? I typed in google.com. This was the request that my browser sent to access google.com. So when you're in the history tab, you can click on one of these requests and then you'll see a split pane view, the request that went to the server and the response that came back. So okay. looking at this, this is the this is the plain text HTTP. I just did a get request to the home page, basically slash of google.com. Surprise, surprise, google.com sends a shitload of tracking cookies because uh, that's Google's business model. There's also a bunch of other headers here. And then Google responded to me with a short response, but basically it was just a redirect, redirecting me to www.google.com. And then we can follow that, you know, the very next, well, not the quite next request, but the next request was here. I followed that redirect to www.google.com. That redirected me then here. And I can just retrace my steps of what my browser did. It's really just like a way to peek under the hood and see what the browser does when I'm interacting with, the, with a, a web page like Google. So let me let me pause here uh, to give people a chance to catch up. Has has anyone been able to replicate kind of what I've done? Like, are you on Google and seeing requests populate within your HTTP history tab? On the same page. Awesome. So uh, anyone? Let me rephrase. I guess anyone struggling with something? It's not working. You're getting an error message, or it's just not not configured correctly. Um, the question I have is when I open the browser, it opens something up called Chromium. Is that, is that what it's supposed to be? Yes. So this, you know, me browsing Google right now, this is Burp's embedded browser. It, uh, it is Chromium. So okay. Chrome, yeah. And, and Chromium is the open source version of Chrome. So it looks very, it looks and feels very similar to Chrome if you're used to Chrome, but this is actually like an embedded open source version of Chrome that ships with Burp. Uh, all right. Well, awesome. If if we're work if we're set up and working, then that was like the smoothest this has ever been for me on any of the cohorts or the workshops that I've taught. Um, and but if you are having trouble or or uh, questions, like please let me know, or we I could have you screen share or walk through issues or anything that comes up. But um, 
if not, I'm going to give you all a kind of a quick tour of Burp Suite's main functionality that we'll want to be using today. Uh, and then we'll jump right into like the vulnerable app that I, I wrote. So I've already shown the intercept tab and the HTTP history tab. Um, just just as a reminder, one thing to note, if you're like browsing in Burp's thing, Burp's browser, and it just is hanging and loading and not working, double check to make sure you don't have intercept on. Like that bites me all the time. Years and years of using Burp Suite, I still get frustrated when I'm like, oh, my internet went out. And then I realize that I actually just have Burp Suite like intercepting and stopping requests. So just toggle that off. Um, the history tab I showed is just a chronological list of all of the requests that you uh, uh, your browser has made. And when you click onto a single one of them, you can see, like I said, the request and the response on the side. Also, it gives you a little bit of like a breakdown if you don't want to read the raw HTTP. Uh, you can see things like listing out what query parameters, what cookies it included, headers, re request or response headers as well. Um, within one of the requests, let me see if I can find, oh man, some of these look really nasty. Like I have no idea what this is doing. Uh, not nasty as in malicious, just like very convoluted like this. Uh, I couldn't even tell you what any of this means. This is just something that Google apparently understands. But let me find a better example. So here's like a, a get request to some sort of ad ID Google UI on adservice.google.com. Like, you know, here we're snooping on how Google is basically tracking us and using the ads. And it sends um, a lot of cookies. If you look at these and, and realize, like, okay, these are gibberish, like, these aren't English words. If you remember at the beginning, there's a good chance that there's some sort of encoding in play. Uh, and if we start to recognize like encoding by site, we might be able to see that something looks like base64 encoding. And if we want to see if this happens to like decode to something in English or like a plain text word, you could copy and paste something or you can highlight something here, right click and send to decoder. And then that brings us up to this decoder tab, which is super useful. Anything that you put here, you can try to encode or decode in a different format. So what I would try is like, okay, this looks to me like gibberish. Maybe it's base64. I pasted it in here. I can decode as base64. And it spits out the raw bytes. Looking at it, it's still gibberish. So this isn't actually like a, a valid ASCII text or something like that. But if we ever had a situation where I wanted to like encode something, I could type hello world, and instead of decode, I could encode as base64. And now that's base64 encoded hello world, and then we can decode that into base64 and re-encode that as ASCII hex. Um, this is just useful like utility feature when we're dealing with wanting to convert data between like hex and base64 and plain text. Um, the decoder tab is, is very useful. And the other tab that I will show, because the only other one we're really going to need or want to use in this particular case, is the repeater tab. Oftentimes when we are testing, what we want to do as testers is send the same thing over and over again with slight variations to see if the server responds any differently. Uh, really, it's like a very common technique to just like maybe change one thing here, what happens? Okay, what, well, let's change that, what happens? Let's change that, what happens? It's kind of like poking around. And the repeater tab is super useful for that. So if we take this uh, get request to addservice.google.com and say we want to like keep sending this same request over and over again with slight variations, we can right click on the request here and say send to repeater. And then the repeater tab ends up populating that request on the left here with a send button. Now, every time I hit the send button, I'm actually sending the request to the exact same place. I'm replaying it or repeating it. And I can keep sending it over and over and over again and read the response that comes from Google here. Now, just replaying it over and over and over again isn't very helpful. Um, if I wanted to say, what would happen if this was a post instead of a get? I can actually modify the request by hand here on the left hit send, and I get a different response. I get method not allowed. So it doesn't like get requests. 
or doesn't like post requests. Um, I can also go back in time with left and right arrows to replay my steps. And uh, let's say, you know, another thing that maybe I want to do is what happens if I don't send any cookies at all? I will delete all the cookies and hit send, and I get the same response. Um, if I want to try deleting other headers, oops, get the same response. But this is essentially the repeater tab lets me take one good request, one request I know like works, and then keep messing with it. And it's all about sending those like bad requests to the server. And then we want to see if it gives us one of those WTF responses that might have a vulnerability. Uh, cool. Any, any questions on those three tabs? It's really all we're going to need is proxy, repeater, and decoder. Ronnie, these are all linked to the Chromium browser that we opened within Burp Sweep, right? This is not linked to any other browser that we might happen to have open, like Chrome or whatever. It's like directly linked to that Chromium browser it opens. Is that right? Correct. Yep. Yeah. So uh, essentially under, like, under the hood, what Burp Suite does automatically for us is create a new instance of Chromium that is pre-configured to use Burp Suite as its proxy. So this makes it a lot easier to get started. If I wanted to, like here is my Chrome window where I had my slides, right? Anything I put here um, is not showing up in Burp Suite because Chrome is not configured to talk to Burp. If I wanted to, I could change the settings for this Chrome instance to also point to Burp, but <laughs> then anything I do, like you know, my slides and everything would be going through Burp. I don't really want that. So I like to keep it separate where stuff that I'm targeting or pen testing is in Burp Suite Chromium. And I have like my own Chrome version that I can browse and not pollute the data. Awesome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So Ronnie, I just want to a quick question. So yes. right now you're obviously you went to Google. So if you're you're basically testing different inputs for Google to see what vulnerabilities they may have on that site, right? It's not testing, it's just checking that one site we're on currently, wherever the browser's on. Uh, I'm I mean, I'm not really checking for vulnerabilities like or doing anything yet. Uh, uh, there's Right now, I'm just at first. I just browsed, and all I did was just log what I was doing. So this was like pure reconnaissance. I hadn't even sent anything to Google that was not normal. Um, when I did the repeater tab and started like changing, you know, from get to post to removing the cookies, now I'm starting getting to get to the territory of like poking and probing Google servers to see what happens. But what I did was nothing like malicious. I, I wasn't looking for any vulnerabilities there. I was just removing cookies or changing a method or something like that. Um, but as we start to use like repeater or sending custom payloads and stuff like that, this is how we would do it. I would, if I wanted to like test Google for cross-site scripting, I might like start putting things like um, malicious script tags in here. Things like, like that could be like a malicious JavaScript. And I'm not gonna do this to Google. Uh, we're gonna switch over and I'll, I'll do it all to my vulnerable web app because I know where those zones are, but this is essentially what we would be doing. Perfect, thank you. Yep, yeah, and, and actually good good point that I should bring up is I use Burp Suite like every single day in my job and like 90% of what I use it for isn't even really security related. It's also just a really good visibility tool. It's like, I just wanna know what my app is doing or what my client is doing when I talk to my app. So I use Burp Suite almost primarily at this point now for just using this proxy and history tab, because I like to see what's happening if I'm trying to debug or troubleshoot an issue. So it's more than just like a security tool. It's, it's just a really good HTTP proxy. Uh, Ronnie, sorry. Uh, could you show me how to do the decoder again? I, I'm a little behind. Oh, sure. So if you just, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll start over here. Um, the decoder tab by default is empty and you can paste or type in anything here. So if I wanted to say like, hello world exclamation point, um, I can put text in and then I can encode it to URL. And this is the exact same value, right? This is hello world, but it's just URL encoded. Or if I wanna see what it looks like in HTML encoding, that's that. Or if I wanna see what it looks like in base 64 encoding, it's that. And then of course you can go backwards too. So if I copy this and paste it here, oops, I can copy that. Then I can decode as base64 and get the plain text back. So if you ever want to manually encode or decode something, it's great to use. 
the other uh, way that you can do it is if you're on like a, the history tab here and you see a value that looks like it could be encoded, you can also copy or uh, sorry, highlight, right click and send to decoder. And that's just the same as basically copying and pasting that value here. And now we can try to decode that and see if it's anything valid, which it's not. Okay, thank you. Yep. All right, then let's jump into uh, our or my vulnerable application. And I'm a little bit of like a comic book nerd. So this is very DC Comics themed. Uh, but our scenario here is, uh, let's say we, we work for Lex Luthor and he's asked us to try to hack into the Justice League Watchtower, which is their base. And we discover that they actually have a portal for the Watchtower at watchtower.ropnop.dev. So this is, <laughs> I'll paste this in the, the Zoom chat. Uh, this is the site that we're gonna be targeting. And I am giving everyone explicit permission and inviting you to go ahead and do whatever you want to this site. Um, and this, we've, we have discovered that this is the portal for Justice League members to log in and use certain things within the Watchtower, which is their secret base that orbits Earth. The first thing uh, I would do as a pen tester and browsing this is uh, open it up and burp, or open it up in the browser and then find that request in burp. And I can see like my first watchtower.ropnop.dev is here. Okay, I'll show you one more, I'm sorry, but I meant to show you one more tab. Uh, there's one more tab that's useful, which is the target tab. And the target tab sitemap is basically a better hierarchical representation of every request in your history. So it actually organizes it by like the top level sites that I visited. And we, after we go to watchtower.ropnop.dev, we can see watchtower.ropnop.dev is here. And then it references like all the pages that it's kind of found. What I'm gonna do is uh, kind of a useful convenience feature for me. I know I only want to target this one site and I only want to actually have burp ever log anything related to this site. I can right click on the top level watchtower.ropnop.dev and just hit add to scope. And add to scope will ask me if I want to basically ignore everything that's not on that site within burp and I'm just going to say yes. So you don't have to do this, but what's going to happen is it's going to make my history a little bit easier because I can hit filter and then filter by request type and show only in scope items. And it's going to just get rid of everything else and just let me focus on the site that I actually care about. Uh, is it is it not loading for anyone else? Is it loading for anyone else? Where did you get uh, the uh, filter option? Uh, if you hit the if you hit where it says filter right here, it'll pop up. A... Oh, sorry. Thank you. It's loading. Cool. Uh, yeah, make sure it's HTTPS and then it, make sure you have intercept, this intercept tab, intercept has to be off. If something looks like it's not loading, it could be burp just blocking it. Well, I'm sorry, where do I go again for the, uh, the interceptor, which tab? Uh, proxy, it's under the proxy tab, and then there's like tabs underneath that. Uh, it's intercept, which is the one on the left here. Can I also ask you to uh, show me again where the filter button is? Yep. So under the target tab is when you'll see this like hierarchical tree of all the sites that you visited within Burp. If you want to just filter for our Watchtower app, because that's all we're going to be focused on right now, um, you can find it. Then you can right click. Mine says remove from scope because it already is there, but you should it should say add to scope. Right, but then how do you filter? Oh, sorry, by... the filter itself. So... Sure. So then um, back in the history tab, which is where it just shows like every request that comes in. Uh, it's kind of confusing. This is a button right here where it says filter. And if you click that, this window pops up, which is the filter settings. And then you can select show only in scope items. Uh, 
Sorry, one more time. Where did you click to get that specific window? The filter window? Uh, yes. Right here. Uh, so hopefully you can see my mouse cursor. Uh, basically right above where it has like the number and the host that should have say the word filter. And if you click in that bar, then the window will pop up. Okay, yeah, I got it. Thank you. It's not clear that it's a clickable button, so I get I understand the confusion. It's always it's always caught me off guard. <laughs> okay. So I encourage you to just kind of follow along with me here. What I'm going to do is walk through finding all like four or five vulnerabilities in this application together. Um, and then this site is always up 24 seven. So even after this class, if you always want to revisit this, and just like use it to practice something, feel free. <coughs> all right, so our goal is to try to get into this watchtower portal. And right off the bat, we see that you must be a member of the Justice League to view this site. But there's a link here, um, which says, please register yourself in your secret identity to get started. And if we hit it, it brings us to a new page here. It asks for our superhero name, which I can just put like Ropnop and my real name I'll put in here. But the registration code, I do not have access to. It's the secret code that should have been given to you by Batman or Superman. So, I mean, I would just try something random. I just type the gibberish in here. And if I hit register, I get bad registration code. So the first thing we need to do is try to figure out how I can get past this um, and anything that I could possibly do to, to register myself to get access without having access to this registration code. So, First thing I would do, uh, and it's first thing I would do on any site that I'm looking at, is figure out what the source code actually is. Like, is this a JavaScript app? Is this like a, a just HTML? And I don't even need Burp for this because what I can, what you can always do is just right click and say View Page Source. So it switches to dark mode, and I can read the HTML that's being rendered into into that DOM and start to get an idea of like what this site is. Like I, I see that it's loading some JavaScript like jQuery. Uh, it looks like it's loading Bootstrap. Then here's the uh, navigation menu in HTML. Here's where it tells me I need to register my superhero. And then I'm curious about that specific like form where it actually asks me to post the data in there. So here's the form, form action, register, post. And I see it asks for superhero name, real name, and registration code. But if I read closely, and sorry, it's dark mode, so this might be really hard for you all to read, uh, there's actually a comment in the source code right down here. And you may think this is like a little bit of a uh, contrived, stupid example, but I see this a lot, and I have seen this a lot, where there's comments that get left over in code that goes to production by developers talking to each other. And sometimes they have sensitive information. So if you're on that registration page and go to uh, uh, right click view source, there's a, a comment down here that says, the default registration code Justice League always works, but I'll make sure to change this before going to prod from the flash. Clearly he did not change it. So I'm going to copy that, go back here, paste that in here and hit register. And that code still works. So that's kind of the, the first dumb way that we got in here was just by looking at, at a comment. But the lesson there is read the source code, figure out if there's any comments that you know developers have accidentally left in there. The nav bar doesn't work at the wedge. Yeah, if it gets if it gets narrow, it has that like drop down menu, but the drop down menu doesn't work. I was ah. trying to figure that out for a minute. I just expanded my screen and was like, oh. And this is why I'm not a front end developer. Uh, <laughs> I, I just used a, a super simple bootstrap template. Um, but yeah, so make sure the, the window is big enough for you all to, to see the screen. But we have now joined the Justice League and we are inside the Watchtower portal as a username Ropnop. And now we can actually start exploring and figuring out what's in here. So I'm just gonna start to with the first tab here and go to Oracle search for villains. 
So this looks like it's a form that lets us tap into Oracle's API on all known villains, enter a search term to see if there are any matches. So I would just try a normal search request here. And I do see that a villain name came back with Joker, and it looks like a link to a Wikipedia article on Joker. We can try searching for random, and we see no results and a Wikipedia article for what we typed in. I'll take a look at what's actually happening in the request for that. And I can find the actual HTTP request here that is using uh, uh, the search bar uh, and sending a search request to get Oracle slash villains search ASDF. Uh, and here's the one that actually worked with Joker. There's multiple ways to approach this. I'm going to use the repeater tab because what I'm interested in is, is that search term injectable in some way? That's user input. And is this server mishandling or mistrusting user input? So if I look at the request response here, um, I can see I sent the word Joker and I got a pretty big HTTP response, but I can use the search bar down here to search for Joker. And I see that my search result Joker is uh, reflected here within the HTTP response or HTML response that comes from the server, both here and here. So as a attacker or a pen tester, what immediately gets me a little suspicious is I sent the server a value and that value was reflected right back to me. If we recall one of the attacks that I outlined this morning, um, when you send a value to a server and the value is reflected in the response, there could potentially be content injection, AKA cross-site scripting. So this would be the first thing that I want to take a look at is understand cross-site scripting. Uh, is it potential if I can send something that's reflected and have it come back to me? And one way that I would do that is to try, try to just put some special characters in here. So it, I'll keep Joker the way it is, but I'm going to put open bracket, close bracket, uh, semicolon, quote mark, double quote mark, question mark, uh, and, and then hit send again. And if I look down here at what happened to my reflected results, I can see that right here on this line, everything was encoded. So it was actually sanitized and escaped correctly. But down here within this uh, uh, reference uh, link, it was not encoded. And to me, this tells me if they're not doing proper validation or output encoding, I might as well try injecting some HTML and see if the browser will interpret it as HTML. So this is a, a in, sorry, Susan, I'm just seeing your question. When I try to send it, ask me to specify details. Uh, send the villain name, or what are you trying to send? Uh, when I copy and paste into the request, and then I hit send at the top of the page, it comes up with this box that says configure target details. Um, okay, if, yeah, so if you you copied and pasted like all of this into the box on the left? Yes. Got it. So um, the, what, the better way to do that instead of copying and pasting is find the request here. And instead of highlighting this and copying and pasting, just right click anywhere inside here and hit send to repeater. And, oh, and okay. the difference is basically like what's happening is, is it's more than just copying and pasting the values here because it, it copies and pastes the values, but it also has to specify the server I want to talk to. So when you just pasted the value, you basically pasted what you want to send, but it didn't capture where you want to send it to. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, figuring out here um, that Joker, the word Joker is being reflected in, within this link here. What I'm gonna try to do is send some valid HTML and JavaScript and see if it'll come back unescaped. 
I recognize that Joker is within a quote, right? It's, it's being constructed as part of a quoted string. So the first thing I want to do is try to break out of that quoted string by putting in a, a closing quote character, so double quotes. Then I'm going to open a bracket and try script alert one and close script. And if I hit send and scroll back down, we can actually see what I did worked because it broke, um, well, almost worked actually, I missed one thing. We can see I, I did break out of the quote here and now I've injected this script alert one into the body of the response. The one thing I missed was I need to close out the A tag by putting a closing bracket after the quote. And let's try that again. And now right here, I can see I've closed out the A tag and I've actually been able to inject additional HTML within a script tag. Now that's all well and good, but that doesn't mean anything until a browser interprets it. So I've done a POC, I've proved out that this works within Burp. I'll switch back over to my browser and try putting the exact same thing in as if I'm browsing here. So I knew it was a closing quote, closing bracket, open bracket, script, alert one, closing script. And let's hit search. And we can see a, an alert box popped up, which is basically, as we talked about, proving that I have control of the JavaScript execution on this page. And I've been able to inject arbitrary JavaScript and get it to render on this page. Hey, Ronnie, is there a reason why in it you entered? I was curious why you entered that opening uh, parenthesis, but never like a closing one. Is there kind of in, in when you actually entered in the request? Yeah, that opening one, but not the closing one. I was kind of curious why. I don't know if I'm missing. Um, the you mean the closing one instead of the opening one? Or the no the parenthesis. If you just open one opening parenthesis, but you never had like another one to follow it with. Um, yeah, that like, one right there. Okay, so it's kind of broken down into two parts. Like this is a complete. The part that's highlighted right now is a complete script opening and script closing with content there. Um, and then this part of uh, quote and closing bracket is because if we look at where, I'll go all the way back to when I just look for Joker with no, um, no special characters. You can draw, I wish I could draw on my screen, but you can almost draw an imaginary line between like my search term up here and what gets reflected right down here. And it's being injected inside a quote and inside a tag. And so in order to basically break out of that element, I have to close the quote and close the tag, and then I could open a new script tag and that would execute. Okay, perfect, thanks. Yep, uh, good question. Okay, so we've, We've proved that we have cross-site scripting, um, and that's that's basically what it looks like when you're trying to find and discover cross-site scripting. Uh, but that's not how we would actually, as an attacker, like exploit cross-site scripting, because we just did that to ourselves, so that doesn't mean much, right? But see this link up here actually has our malicious payload in it. We could technically send, copy and paste this link and send it to somebody and ask them to click on it. And when they click on it, JavaScript will execute on this page when they load the page, and we could potentially like read information from their browser or take advantage of their session. We actually already have uh, that written for us, since we work for Luther Corp or Lex Luther. Uh, if you go to if we go to LutherCorp.ropnop.dev, um, we already have some pre-existing malicious payloads here. So the first one, we, what we just discovered was cross-site scripting one. So I'd like to show you what it would look like if a unsuspecting victim were to click on this link. And so let's say we send this to like Superman, but it's distract, you know, it says cat meme instead of cross-site scripting one and Superman clicks on it. Uh, open that up and then click here. So he would click on here to see a cat meme. We get JavaScript that pops up and it's a little message that says, ha ha, Ropnop, I now know your secret identity is Ronnie Flathers from Lex Luthor. So this is an example of by clicking a link, what happened there was Watchtower loaded, JavaScript executed, and Lex Luthor sent malicious JavaScript that then read from our browser what our real name was and what our secret identity was and stole that information.
and then the page finished loading and we can actually see what the payload looked like. It was very similar, but instead uh, it, it loaded a malicious steel identity JavaScript and executed it in our context. A little bit, again, a bit of a contrived example, but uh, does that make sense how any JavaScript we write, if we can get it to execute, we can steal sensitive information from whoever clicks that link? R Ronnie, I, th I think so. And that, this has been so cool. I'm What I'm trying to follow though is, is this information, how is this information then making it back to uh, Luther Corp, for example. So like as like the user, as the end user is Superman, I just followed a link, I got duped, mm -hmm. I saw the alert box, my information was exposed. But how did Luther, how did the attacker then access that information? Yeah, uh, good question. And And the reason it's a contrived example is like, I would never, if I was a real black hat, I would never pop an alert box and tell someone I just stole their information. Like that part's entirely unnecessary. I just need to steal their information, right? Um, but the answers would lie directly within this script. So this is malicious JavaScript and we can actually just open that up in a tab if we wanna see what it looks like. And what this does is it reads the cookie which contains the user's session information. Um, you know, it's four lines of JavaScript, but it's basically just going to read the session cookie, parse the session cookie as uh, JSON, and then inside that session cookie is the usernames and their identity. And then this last line is alerting the message. In a in a real scenario, instead of alerting the message, you would just send that back to some server or send it to me discreetly, and I would steal it and not let the person know that I had that info. Awesome. Thanks. That makes sense. I feel like a super villain would probably add that alert at the very end anyway. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I've watched, I've watched enough uh, uh, Justice League and cartoons and comic books to know that, yeah, they, they love to explain exactly what they did and their plan to give Justice League just enough time to stop it. Right. All right. So that's the first uh, cross-site scripting. The next one uh we're going to switch down instead of the villain search, we're going to go to the heroes search. And this one is, seems similar. It says it's going to tap into Oracle's API on all known Justice League heroes, enter a search term for real time filtering. So if we, we looks like we have a list of several Justice League members here. And if we want to start filtering, we can, oh, if we type B, it instantly filters, and then BA, it instantly filters there. What I'm curious in is how is this filtering occurring? Am I sending anything to the server? And if I go look at Burp Suite as I was typing like B and A, I recognize that I didn't actually send any HTTP requests to the server. There was only one request sent to API slash heroes that returned with everything in JSON. And then anything I type or put here doesn't cause anything to be sent. So this is all being done client side then. Essentially, this is like a React component or something that is dynamically filtering data for me on the client side without having to talk to the server. And I can actually verify that if you watch my address bar as I type or as you type, you can see your address bar is also updating with your search term here. So again, I'm thinking, uh, let's put in something gibberish and uh, Again, I see that my gibberish is being reflected here on the DOM, which makes me also want to investigate potentially um, cross-site scripting. So since I don't have anything going to the server, I'm not gonna use Burp Suite for this. Everything will be done client side. Um, what I'd like to do is take a look at these elements and I can right click and inspect and I'll open them on the bottom here. So as I'm typing, the DOM down here is updating with FFFF, and it's the exact same scenario as before. We're, we're writing data inside a link here. So one thing that I would want to try to do exactly as before is can I type something that breaks out of this link and injects content like a script?
So that didn't do anything. No, I didn't see an alert box, but let's take a look at what actually happened. It looks like in my DOM down here, if you can read this, apologies, it's probably very small. Um, it looks like we did break out and we actually did inject something like valid HTML in a script, but it did not trigger, it did not fire. And there's a really uh, uh, tricky reason why that, that does not work. <coughs> and apologies, I can't even remember if I mentioned it during the lecture portion, but what we're dealing with here is potential DOM-based cross-site scripting in which we're trying to inject JavaScript or code into JavaScript that's already executing. The JavaScript that's already executing is what's handling the dynamic filtering for me. And I'm trying to basically break out of that and execute JavaScript. I can't actually inject a script into a script. So there's art, like I can't put a script tag into something after the page is already loaded. But what I can do is inject something like an image. So what I can actually do in, in this scenario is instead of a script, I'll try to load an image. And you can see actually, as I was typing, my browser just tried to load an image there, but it didn't work. Like that icon popped up. Our, so we're talking with our browser, we're injecting into it. We're trying to load an image, but it's not loading. Um, when it doesn't load, we can actually throw a on air handler, which will tell the browser if this airs out, execute JavaScript. And I mean, I, as literally as soon as I finished typing alert one, the, the browser threw an alert one box. So we've proved out that we have the ability to inject JavaScript into a running JavaScript application, which is DOM based cross site scripting. I mean, literally, like, right, as soon as I close this out, it pops up because it's consistently running. And as soon as it's valid JavaScript, it hits. So very similarly, um, once we discover that, we can send this, you know, send a crafted URL to Superman again. And I think I have that here in Luther Corp. Cross-site scripting two, click here. It's a slightly different link, but ultimately it's gone ahead and, and done the exact same type of attack, but through DOM-based cross-site scripting instead of reflected cross scripting. This one's a little bit more complicated, as you can see. Uh, it requires like fetching and then catching it and then evaluating it, but the end result is the exact same. What we've done is fetched remote JavaScript and put it to this running origin and executed it so we can read the cookie. Mine did not actually pop up. Is there Pretty sure I did exactly the, the same. Uh, you went to like the Luther curve one didn't pop up or just trying to manually do it? Oh, let me see if I just change it real quick. Oh, when I manually did it like that, it works. When I did, when I used the, uh, the Luther Corp XSS2 or XSS2, uh, it, didn't, I didn't get a pop-up. Huh, that's interesting. Are you using Chromium or Firefox? Uh, oh, sorry, I'm using Firefox. Okay. Um, yeah, there's a funny thing when you're testing for cross-site scriptings like this is sometimes the browsers are too helpful, like actually helpful here and will block very obvious cross-site scriptings. So that may be what happened if you look like in your Firefox console or something. I've seen this before with Chrome as well, where it'll be like, wait, this is a cross-site scripting attack. I'm not doing this. And they'll, they'll block it on your behalf. Um, and so that, that could be what's happening. Or Firefox is doing some sort of URL encoding or normalization on that link that Chromium doesn't handle. I guess I obviously built this POC only for Chrome instead of Firefox. There are edge cases, though, like if you're an attacker, certain cross-site scripting payloads work on Chrome, but not Firefox, or work on Internet Explorer, but not Safari. So th there definitely are edge cases. I, I don't know exactly what's happening there. It looks like it's stringified the uh, a bunch of the script. Okay, yeah, that's, anyway, thanks, sorry about that. No, no worries, no, it's a good call out, yeah. Um, and, and these are like stupid, simple, like no frills cross-site scriptings. Uh, it was actually harder for me to write these because I had to like disable so many security features that are automatically built in to get this to work, just to show the simple example. Um, 
Uh, but that's exactly what you're seeing is like, this is so obviously a cross-site scripting payload that browsers are just automatically like stringifying it for you or not executing it. All right, moving along, um, that's cross-site scripting. There's two more uh, volumes I just wanted to demo if you're following along here. Uh, the next tab over is the location database. Database is kind of a hint at what kind of vulnerability this might be, right? Uh, form will let you tap into the Justice League database of superheroes operating in cities around the universe. So let's just try searching for Metropolis. Uh, Metropolis. Hey, Ronnie, before we move on real quick, I just want to yep. ask, um, so you said that in certain cases, like when it's really obvious that you're trying to do cross-site scripting that will just ignore the request. So why is it not the case that it would like automatically, or why would it not be the default behavior like in any, every case? Uh, like, won't, won't that ever be useful? Yeah, so I mean, I'm, I guess when I say like it's super obviously a cross-site scripting, what really what I mean is like what I've seen Firefox and Chrome do is when you have a, a variable parameter like search and the value of that variable has open bracket, script, close bracket, and like valid JavaScript in there, um, the browsers will automatically encode these special characters for you to prevent cross-site scripting. And, uh, and there's, there's much more tricky cross-site scripting payloads that don't use such obvious cues as like the word script or these types of special characters. Um, and there's ways to like bypasses depending on browser or your web application firewall to encode or re-encode or double encode certain things. Um, sometimes cross-site scripting is really like a cat and mouse game. It's like, you know, you have the payload working, but now you just have to like construct it in such a way that it gets past the browser or the WAF. Um, also, a lot of cross-site scripting is not really done in the URL, like get queries. They're, they're going to be in like more complex queries that are posts and in bodies and things like that. Um, so those are much harder to detect. The browsers really don't, don't stop there. They just, they just do some default sane encoding on URLs so that you can't really pass in. Sometimes you can't pass in valid characters in the URL. So is it like just a case of like, that's just how HTML works? Like if you have, or actually, I'm asking like specifically, like like in the case that you type in like a URL and like it has like the script in the URL, like what the web browser would just interpret that like as actual JavaScript that's being, that's being executed? No, the, the, the browser would not, the browser just interprets this as text. Um, what's actually happening is when this gets, so this, Sorry, let me let me actually maybe show a, a, a better example here. Let's open up that Luther Corp link. For cross-site scripting one. I'm gonna turn on intercept so you can see exactly what happens when I click this link. So if I click this link, the browser is stuck right now because Burp has just just uh, tried to capture this. This is what my browser is trying to send based on the payload that I just sent. And you can see that this URL parameter is totally encoded. Uh, this is all just a bunch of percent signs and symbols. And this is what the browser is sending to the server. Now, I'll forward it on, right? We get the pop-up. But if I look at the history, we can see the server received all of these like percent encoded uh, cross-site scripting payload. And it sent back a, uh, oh, it's funny, I, I guess I had it cached. So it didn't send me the full response. It just hit my cache. But uh, this was not interpreted as JavaScript until it came back in the response. And if I, if I highlight this and, and send it to the decoder, it looks like gibberish, but this actually is, gets decoded on the server be a URL encoding directly into a cross-site scripting payload. Yeah, when you highlighted it on the inspector over there on the right at the bottom, it, it, it already ran that for you. On yeah, the proxy. yeah, Burp's smart enough to recognize it. So Burp, if I just yeah. leave my mouse there, it'll also decode it for me. Is that is that helpful? Yeah. Did, did I answer your question? OK. 
Yeah, and and I mean, this is just single URL encoding of a payload, um, which you can also understand, like, you know, why a user might be willing to click on something, right? If they're if their link said like search equals like script steal your money dot js, that you know you might pause, but if it just looks like a bunch of gibberish like this, I see links like this all the time from like Google and shopping you know, sites, you, you click on it without really thinking about what's inside that URL. <coughs> All right. So we'll switch over to or back to the database and I have intercept on so turn that off. And we'll just do like a, a standard search for Metropolis. Um, we see that something comes up. If I just put gibberish in there, I get no results. Just like anything with web security, what happens if I put something like random with some special characters in there? So if I do like foobar, single quote, double quote, open bracket, blah, blah, blah. Ah. That's a very interesting error message to me. This is like the kind of WTF response that we're looking for when a server gets back to us. And it says uh, SQL error, unrecognized token, bad queries, select star from locations where location like foobar and then a bunch of gibberish here. What this tells me right off the bat is that we are able to construct and send SQL statements on the back end, And if they error out, the server gives us a SQL error. So immediately we're going to try, I'd like to try doing um, SQL injection. And one thing that I can look at is if I type foobar and then maybe just like a single quote, I see the query that was trying to be constructed is select star from locations where location like single quote foobar. And then there was another double quote and two double quotes, and that's why it aired out. So I'd like to try to break out of foobar and start adding additional SQL on top of that. Um, so what I can do is something like foobar single quote to close it out or one equals one. This is valid, right? This or one equals one will then be added to the end of the statement. That'll be true. And that works. And it basically dumped the entire table for us uh, because everything was true. There really was no filter. That's cool and all. We've proved it out. I already knew, uh, you know, most of these locations where I could have guessed them. So let's see if there's other information we can extract from this database because we're not just limited to this table. And I'm going to kind of fly through these quickly, but I just I, I know this well enough, or I've I've done. I kind of know where to start with like SQL injection, but we know that foo single quote breaks us out, and now anything we write after this is valid SQL. I know it's SQLite. So let's figure out what version of SQLite is running. Oh, I shouldn't have hit submit because I wanted to show you. Okay, but we see I'm breaking out and then I'm executing some custom SQL here to union select along with a function called SQLite version that will return the version number of SQLite in my response. And when I send it, I get a weird looking table here. There's a one here, but there's a 3.31.1 here, which is the actual version of SQLite. So now I'm talking to the database and asking it to run functions for me. And the results of those functions are actually coming back in the HTTP um, responses to my server. So the next thing that I'd wanna do is say, what other tables are there in this database? And I might do something like union select one, name from SQLite master where type equals table. So what this should do is also select and return all of the table names from the SQLite master schema. Okay, and I, I see that besides locations, there's also a secret, there's another table called identities. Working for Lex Luthor, that sounds pretty juicy if I can get all the secret identities of the superheroes. So the next thing that I'll do is union select uh, star from identities. And what this should do is, is select this table uh, and dump it out here. 
and we can see it worked. Um, so now I'm reading from a table I'm not even supposed to have access to read uh, by injecting raw SQL, and I can see the secret identity of the names of all of the Justice League members. Um, question. So yes. in, when you were doing the um, search statements, I noticed that you were adding two dashes at the end um, uh, after the closing. So why do we need to do that? Great question. Um, yeah. So semicolon in SQL ends the statement, right? So it'll stop executing when it hits semicolon. The problem is that and I, actually, I'm not even entirely sure if it's necessary in this case, but out of habit, what happens is imagine that there was more stuff that the server is trying to add. You know, the server could be also adding in something like limit one or another type of query. And we're, we're not injecting to the end of the statement. We're injecting right in the middle of it, but we want it to ignore everything after we do. That's the magic semicolon dash dash, because semicolon in SQL means end the statement and dash dash is a comment marker. So by doing the semicolon, we're stopping the statement. And then with dash dash, we're making everything after that a comment so it won't be executed. So it's a way to basically just tell SQL stop as soon as you hit my query and don't add anything else. Gotcha, that's pretty cool. Uh, yeah, uh, SQL injection is fun when you find it. This is a, again, a very straightforward one. Um, and I was just able to do it by hand, but there's much more complex techniques and tools to help you craft like crazy complex uh, SQL statements to extract information out. Like some of my favorite SQL injection techniques are when you talk, you can talk to the database, but you don't get any information back. They're called blind SQL injection. So you, you can tell, basically you think you're talking to the database, but you don't, you have no indication like, yes, like you can't get data out. And one way that you can test for that is doing something like, like sleep five and then hit send. And if your response takes five seconds to come back to you, you know you've actually triggered a sleep statement and you're talking to the backend database. So you can get these timing type techniques down where you're sending like the server and telling it to sleep for five seconds and then timing how long the response takes to come back. And you can, you can blindly figure out you're talking to the database. Then you can start writing ridiculously cool and co like crazy complex queries that are basically, I, don't, I have no idea how to do it off the top of my head, but basically take the first letter of the first column of the first table. And if it's A, sleep one second, otherwise sleep two seconds. And then you time the response. And if it's one second, you know it's an A. If it's two seconds, then you repeat it with B. And, if it, and then you keep doing that and you do these timing yes or no questions to figure out every single character to name the entire database schema. And that's the, that's the stuff that you would script and do automatically. There's no way you do that kind of stuff by hand, but there are ways to like, even without getting any responses back, you can still extract data. Uh, all right, so that's SQL injection. Um, the last one that I want to show, and we're, uh, I think we're actually good on time, is if we go to the credits tab. Um, here, apparently, there's some crime fighting credits that the Justice League has, and we're able to transfer them. So I'm Ropnop, and I have a thousand credits. And if I want to like transfer five credits to Aquaman, I can successfully transferred five credits to Aquaman, and now I have 995 left. So if we switch over to Burp Suite, curious what that actually looks like, we'll see that there's a post request to slash credits, and there's two variables here, recipient and amount. And then of course, this post request takes my session cookie and takes an action on it. What we look for, now, you know, we start thinking like, okay, this is a state change in request that uses a session cookie and uh, is all done over HTML. There's no JavaScript here. This is prime for a CSERF attack. And there's no apparent CSERF protections because there's no additional CSERF token value or CSERF token cookie. So we'll actually want to construct and do a CSERF attack against this. And we'll switch over to LutherCorp and I'll show you what that looks like. 
Yeah, there's probably a negative credit. There's actually, yeah, good call. Uh, there's more vulns in this app than I'm demoing. So uh, definitely feel free to revisit this and poke around. That's definitely a slightly intentional bug. Okay. If we go to Luther Corp and look at the csurf.html page, before I click it, I wanted to show you what it is. This is all the csurf payload does. It's 10 lines of HTML. All it is is a form that copies the exact template as that credits transfer. So credits post, but this time the recipient is Lex Luthor and the amount is 100. So we send this link to Superman again and say, hey, click this for a cat meme. And when Superman clicks this link, I didn't take any actions, but all of a sudden I landed on this page that says that I just successfully transferred 100 credits to Lex Luthor. And now my credits are down to 895. And again, if I click on this, I didn't do anything, but there's another 100 credits to Lex Luthor. When we look at Burp Suite, this is the C Surf attack in, in action here. Our browser did send a post request to credits to send money to Lex Luthor, and it automatically included our session cookie, even though the refer. Um, the referrer came from Luther Corp and our server was misconfigured to just not check for potential CSERF and it went ahead and executed that transfer request, even though it didn't prompt us for any additional verification. That's what a CSERF attack really looks like in action. My like whole example earlier of transferring money via chase, like this is what you would see. You would essentially click a link or be, be tricked into visiting a site. And then all of a sudden you'd land on a page that said you successfully did something. You had no idea how you did that. So cool. Um, any final questions or anything you want me to go back and rewalk through? Uh, hopefully that was that was helpful just following along, kind of a mix of like testing different things as well as using Burp Suite to see what's happening under the hood. Um, if the next thing is it, we'll take a little break and I'll open up the CTF and then we'll do that for an hour and um, declare the winner after that. But before I, I switch to break to open up the CTF, anything you want to revisit or look at on the Watchtower? Cool. Um, all right. So I need about five, at least five minutes to just stop sharing so I can fire up the CTF server and then I'll share that out. So if everyone wants to take a break, it's 2.45. Uh, I guess we can do 10 minutes. So like five to three, everyone comes back and then I will share the link out for the CTF and then maybe we'll officially launch it at three and run it until four or 4.30 if you want a little bit more time. Sound good? Sounds great. All right, let's, let's do it. All right, then I will see you all in 10 minutes.